In this video, we consider testing our decisions to see how safe they are with sensitivity analysis. This technique also allows us to focus on those variables in a decision which we need to ensure our estimates are as accurate as possible for. We'll also consider simulations and scenario planning as ways of helping to further inform the decision maker before they make a choice. First, let's consider sensitivity analysis. Imagine Jack, who owns a sandwich shop, is considering launching a new line of yogurts to sell as desserts. He's done his preliminary analysis as follows. Sales price, $2 a yogurt. Variable cost, $1.25 a yogurt. Volume, 1000 per week. And fixed costs, $500 per week. His forecast profit would be sales revenue of a thousand times two dollars is two thousand dollars. Variable cost a thousand times one dollar twenty five is one thousand two hundred and fifty dollars, giving us a contribution of seven hundred and fifty dollars. Less fixed costs of five hundred dollars, giving us a profit of two hundred and fifty dollars. On the basis that it creates a positive profit, Jack is poised to say yes and launch his new line of yogurt desserts. Jack is considering how robust his decision is. How sensitive is his decision to say yes to the various estimates in his original calculation? Firstly, sales price. How low would the sales price have to fall, assuming this affects nothing else in the process, before the profit is nil? and Jack would decide not to launch. Sales revenue would have to fall by $250, everything else being equal, to wipe out the profit of $250 and reduce it to zero. This is a reduction of $250 divided by $2,000 is 12.5%, or a reduction down from $2 to $2 less 12.5% is $1.75. Jack would say he is 12.5% sensitive to his estimate of sales price. A lower percentage would imply increased sensitivity. Next, variable cost. Variable cost would have to increase by $250 to eliminate the profit and change Jack's mind, which is an increase of $250 over $1,250 is 20% or an increase from $1.25 per yogurt to $1.25 times 1.2 is $1.50 per yogurt. Jack is 20% sensitive to his original estimate of variable cost. Next, sales volume. A reduction in sales volume affects both sales revenue and variable cost. In other words, it affects contribution. Contribution, and so sales volume, would need to fall by $250 over $750 is 33% to eliminate profits. This would mean a reduction from the current 1,000 units to 667 units per week. Jack is 33% sensitive to sales volume. Finally, fixed cost. Fixed costs would need to increase by $250 from the current $500 to eliminate the profit entirely. This is an increase of $250 over $500 is 50%. Jack is 50% sensitive to his estimate of fixed costs. Hopefully by now the approach is feeling familiar. In general sensitivity is the amount we can stand to lose divided by the value affected by the variable we're looking at. For example, fixed costs again. The amount we can stand to lose is $250. The value affected by the variable we're looking at is $500, the fixed costs themselves. $250 divided by $500 is 50%. The decision maker can then focus on those variables with a low percentage when refining their estimates and considering their final decision. Unfortunately, although sensitivity analysis adds an extra dimension to assist the decision maker, it is not without its drawbacks. Firstly, 
it's not an optimizing technique. In other words, it doesn't give you a yes, no answer in terms of should I continue. It simply says, if you're wrong by more than X percent, you've made a mistake. Secondly, it doesn't include any consideration for how likely you are to be wrong. For example, it looks like you should be concerned about a variable with, say, only 0.5% sensitivity. But if the number concerned is a solid number, for example, if you have a binding quotation from someone, so it simply isn't going to be wrong, there's no need to worry. It also only looks at one variable changing at a time. This is clearly unrealistic. In the real world, variables are interrelated and tend to change all at the same time. There's a technique that can help us here though, it's called simulation. With Jack's yogurt decision, he used what are known as point estimates for each of the variables. In other words, he gave each variable one number. Take sales volume for example. Jack estimated sales volume as being a thousand. In reality, of course, it could be higher or it could be lower. If we had the experience or could do sufficient research, we might produce a more detailed probability distribution. Many variables are normally distributed. In this sense, the word normal is a technical term. Here is an example of a normal distribution that might better represent the potential volume of sales. It may have an expected average of a thousand units, but it could be higher or could be lower. Very much higher or very much lower is, however, less likely than just being a little bit higher or lower. How widely spread around the average the curve is, is described by the standard deviation, or sigma. For example, here is a distribution with a large standard deviation, and here's a distribution with a small standard deviation. The standard deviation is calculated using this formula, where EV stands for expected value or average. In our example, this is 1,000 yogurts. P is probability, and X is a possible outcome. Suppose, for example, some basic research showed the following. A thousand units with a probability of 0 0.5, 800 units with a probability of 0 0.25, and 1,200 units with a probability of 0 0.25. The expected value is calculated as 0 0.5 times 1,000 plus 0 0.25 times 800 plus 0.25 times 1200 is a thousand units. The standard deviation can be calculated by building up a table as follows. The standard deviation would be the square root of 20,000, which is 141. Getting back to Jack, he could replace one or more of the point estimates with probability distributions, many of which may be normal distributions like we have considered. He, or rather a computer he is using, could then combine together the probability distributions to come up with a probability distribution of profit rather than the current point estimate of $250. It might look something like this. Jack can then see the range of profits he may achieve and the spread or how variable those profits may be. Although once again this is not an optimizing technique and that it doesn't give him a yes no answer, it nevertheless gives him a more realistic picture of what the future might hold. All this assumes of course he can get reasonable information on the underlying probability distributions in the first place. This may take lots of time and expense, and so in the real world is often reserved for decisions where very large sums of money are involved. Don't worry, in your exam you won't be expected to prepare a simulation, only to talk about how they work, what they show, and the pros and cons of doing them. You may be required to calculate a standard deviation, but nothing more. Lastly, let's consider scenario planning.
or what-if analysis. Often organisations will consider a series of plausible future events to map out how they might affect the business and how the business could plan in advance to respond. For example, an airline might consider what happens if fuel prices increase by 30%. This does rely on there being sufficient skill and experience in the organisation to consider which variables to focus on, but it can be a useful tool to help organisations plan in advance. In conclusion, we've seen that sensitivity analysis, simulations and scenario planning are all useful tools to help the decision maker when facing risk and uncertainty, albeit no method is perfect. For your exam, make sure you can perform the necessary calculations, but also be prepared to interpret the results and discuss the advantages and disadvantages of the methods themselves.